Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. I'm excited that you're here. I hope that God moves through this message to reach you so he can move through your life. Be sure to share and subscribe so that we can reach the world with God's word. Enjoy the message. Good morning, Family Church. Good morning. That sounded like a school, didn't it? Like, welcome to class. We're going we're gonna to go to class today. We're going to learn all about Jesus. Actually, we're going to learn about Joseph, who's also, uh, if you don't know, he's a, a foretelling of Jesus. But uh, I, I, I came today, and I don't know if he's in here, but somebody had the funniness to post on my Facebook uh, a, a nice little meme about God changing your message. Oh, yeah, thank you, because that's exactly what happened. Uh, I had a whole different route that I wanted to go with this, and uh, literally yesterday morning at like 6 a.m., God was like, nah, scratch that and do this. So uh, today, luckily it's still about Joseph, so all the things that I studied weren't for nothing, but um, I'm excited about this today. I feel like God wants us to know that no matter where you are, you cannot stop God's plan. If he wants to do it, he's going to do it. Will do it, and it doesn't matter what people try to do to you because nothing can stop God's plan from happening in your life. Nothing can stop it. It might not be on the timeline that you think, it might not look like what you thought it would look like when you get there, but nothing is going to be better than God's plan in your life. Nothing is ever going to be better than what God has for you. And if you know, Uh, Anything about the story of Joseph, it's in Genesis 37 till uh, chapter 50, till the end of Genesis. And if you know anything about it, God gave Joseph a dream that showed him his purpose. I know y'all are probably like, oh, another message on purpose. Clearly, God wants you to know about your purpose, but this isn't really about purpose. But all the messages are about purpose because you have a purpose. There we go. How many times did I say it? (laughs) But it showed him... It showed Joseph that one day he would be in a position where his family was bowing down to him. And while he's given, you know, the the end game, he's given a glimpse of uh, the goal, I guess, if you will. He's he's given the purpose of of, of what it's going to look like, of how it's going to play out. I'm sorry, he's not given how it's going to play out. He had no idea that the process for his purpose meant going to prison. And I don't know if any of you have ever been to prison. That's not a fun place to be, even if you're just visiting. Uh, If you're watching somehow from prison, uh, I'm glad you're getting this message. But know that the prison could be part of your process. How many of you would rather skip that part of the process in your story? And you're like, well, I don't want to go to jail. Well, what about the broken part? What about the sad part, the depression part, the, the, uh, the addiction part that you might have gone through? Or maybe you're still going through. Joseph didn't know the full scope of what the dream truly meant. Uh, if we can rise for the word of God, I know I, I, I did this a little bit different. I'm going to read a couple things. Um, if you want to write it down, mainly Acts 7. But I'm going to start in Genesis 37, just verse 5. Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. This means they literally already hated him. That's not a good feeling for anybody. It's not fun to feel hated. It's not fun especially to feel hated by people that you love, your family members. And our main portion of the text today, Acts 7, starting in verse 9. Because the patriarchs, that's talking about Joseph's brothers, uh, the leaders of the tribes of Israel, because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave into Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him from all his troubles. He gave Joseph wisdom and enabled him to gain the goodwill of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So Pharaoh, and that is not his name. They just don't record his name. That's just his position. So Pharaoh made him ruler over Egypt and all his palace. If you're wondering why I picked the verses in Acts to talk about 13 chapters of Genesis, that's because this is literally just a summary of Genesis. And I didn't think y'all wanted to sit here while I read 13 chapters of the Bible. 
I'm just kidding. But uh, we, we know that God gives Joseph a dream. But what do you do when the dream looks different than you thought? You arrive to the place of your dream and when you would want to think, this is it. This is it. In reality, you're thinking, is this it? That's what I want to talk to you today. The dream looks different. Jesus, we thank you for what you are doing. I pray that you use me. Holy Spirit, I am a a vessel. Just speak through me. And say the words that the people need to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. I don't know why I said it like that. I felt like a, like a judge. <laughs> Have you, uh, has anybody in here, and if you're sitting by the person that has done this, it's probably best to just stay looking at me and not raise your hand. But has anybody in here been betrayed by anybody that you love? Anybody that you thought you knew? Y'all are quiet. You don't have to raise your hand. You can just, yeah, my cousin Joe. And in reality, it's the guy sitting right next to you. But uh, the people that you thought you loved, you thought they loved you as much as you loved them. And the question I want to ask you today, did it make you bitter or did it make you better? I know that's like so heavy to start with, but y'all know me. I'm just like right out the gate, Mike Tyson. Uh, you know, and, and you're going along and you're meaning well and, and you're just living your life and you just want to make everybody happy and you, you're minding your own business and you're doing your own thing and you're trying to help people out where you can, trying to serve where you can. And suddenly someone near to you just does something completely off the wall and hurts you so bad, breaks your heart, shoves you to the side. And as is, is often the case with humans, we normally get bitter by this and then we end up cutting them off completely. You know, and then we'll brag about it uh, passively on Facebook, like they don't know who they're who you're talking about on Facebook. And you know, uh, you're praying to Jesus, but it's more like God. I hope you burn their house down and give them a flat tire on the way from home from church, and uh, you know something worse. So if that's you, the altar will be open by the end of service. Please come confess your sins. Jesus is not what you think that way. <laughs> But we end up letting them live uh, rent-free in our heads, right? They just dominate our thoughts, and they're all we can think about because it makes us bitter. And while we might not be in a physical prison like Joseph was, we become trapped by our own thoughts, imprisoned by the institution of our imagination, just because I like to make words sound the same. But maybe you're in a different kind of prison right now. Maybe you're trapped by all the bills that you have sitting on the dining room table that you have no idea how you're going to pay. Maybe you're in the prison of battles that you're facing with some friends or family, and uh, your house looks more like uh, the UFC ring than you know how you would like it to look. Maybe you're, you're in a prison of a job that you absolutely loathe and hate going to, and while you don't want to sit in church all day, you kind of want to sit in church all day because you don't really want to go to work on Monday and get back to something that you actually actually just completely hate. Maybe you're in a prison controlled by the fear of failure over your life and you're, fa- you're, you're fearing to fail at something in your life. Maybe you're in the prison of perfectionism and I'll go ahead and tattletale on myself on that one. That is a prison I get trapped in all the time because if it, if it is not perfect, I do not want to do it. Uh, I like everything, you know, to be laid out and nice and organized, and uh, I'm just a perfectionist by nature. God is working with me on it. You don't have to send me a letter and, you know, <laughs> pray 37 verses of the Bible over me. Um, uh, it's, it's there. It's happening. Maybe you're in the prison of negative mindsets and thinking. Maybe uh, the prison you're in is just in your mind. Maybe you're in the prison of fearing Uh, of being judged by other people just for simply being different. Maybe you don't have really anything in your life. You're just a little bit different, and you don't want people to find out that you're different, so you try to act like something that you're not. And we see from the life of Joseph how to handle these bad situations and stick through the process to see what God truly has in store. Because Joseph was a little bit different, right? He was given the dream, and the dream made him different. And uh, while he might have been a little bit misguided as a young man, he was, I think, 17 when he was given this dream, and he might have just been trying to do what was right, but his brothers hated him for it. He goes and he makes the mistake of telling his brothers about his dream. Wrong idea. Nobody wants you to come up to them and say, hey, one day you're going to be bowing down to me. That's probably not going to work out in your favor. They might not throw you into a pit like they did with Joseph, 
but you're probably not going to be talking to them that much longer. And while this could have made him bitter and plot his revenge, he instead was used for their redemption. And if you don't know, or maybe you're just starting out on this wonderful Christian life and you're trying to pick up the Bible, but it's incredibly confusing. Just to give you a little backstory, Joseph is a descendant of Abraham. And God is the one, God, God promised Abraham several different things. And that is how pretty much everyone got here. <clears throat> and when you give your life to Jesus, you're grafted into the line of Abraham. He was, he was promised to be made into a great nation. He was promised to be blessed. He's promised that his name would be great. And most importantly, well, maybe not most importantly, but to me it's a really big deal. He was promised to be a blessing to others, not just for himself. God tells him that he will bless those who bless Abraham and curse those who curse him. But it is through the life of Joseph that this is most directly fulfilled to be a blessing over other nations and people. And Joseph ends up being the favorite son of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel after he wrestled with God. Don't ask me to explain that one to you. <clears throat> Some of you are still doing it right now. But uh, Joseph's, or Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and he's the one that gives birth. Well, he, he's not the one that gives birth. I know that's like a thing in 2024 that you can think that happens, but that's not how it worked. He had a, a couple different ladies, um, and they give birth to the 12 sons that become the 12 tribes of Israel. But Joseph, uh, let's see, how can I explain this? Jacob, so he worked for seven years thinking he was going to get one wife, Rachel. Instead, he gets tricked by his father-in-law and ends up marrying Leah. Uh, and then he has to work seven more years to marry Rachel. Now, Rachel is the pretty one, and Leah is um, a nice, just really good friend. Um, <laughs> we'll just go with that. Read your Bible. The Bible's not boring. It's interesting. So Joseph is the firstborn son of Rachel, right? So he is, he is the favorite son of Jacob. And he's given this brightly colored robe, which shows his position of honor in his house. And it's even thought that this robe, since it differed from the normal work clothes, that he would have been excused from certain duties. So to bring this into perspective of today's terms, this is like the guy who only got a job because his daddy is the foreman at work or his daddy works in the office and he just gets to put on the safety vest and walk around with the clipboard and tell everybody what they're doing wrong and then going back to playing Candy Crush on his phone. So uh, none of his brothers like him because of this, they don't, not just because of the robe. They hate literally everything about him, everything he has to say, what he's wearing, what he smells like, probably what his favorite oatmeal is or whatever they ate back then. The Bible says they hated him for it. And then the day comes that God gives him a dream that shows that they're all going to bow down to him. Now, I don't know about you, and the Bible doesn't say this, and I'm not trying to uh, eisegete or put something into the text, but he is a teenager. So we don't know at this time if it kind of puffed up his pride a little bit, or maybe if he was just acting like a prophet and just telling his brothers, this is what God showed me. This is what's going to happen. We don't know, but he made the mistake <laughs> of telling them about it. So now the dream shows not only is he the favorite, he is also favored by God. The dream shows that God wants to bless him and it ends up making his brothers bitter. A dream can be dangerous. A dream can be dangerous. Do not be surprised that the gifts that God gives you to bless you with or to bless others with ends up making those around you bitter. Somebody knows what that feels like. People don't always immediately enjoy something that stands out, right? We all have, we've fallen into the trap now in society where we all want to fit in and we all want to, you know, just blend in and, and look like it, you know, fashion, we, we, if you want to follow that, whatever the heck is going on now with fashion, I don't even know what they're wearing anymore, but we, we try to hide what makes us different. We'll try to hide what makes us weird. We'll try to hide the things that make us excited. We try to hide the things that make us happy because we want to just fit in. 
And, and, and side note here, if somebody comes to you and they're really excited about something, even if it's just a dumb TV show, and you tell them, like, wow, that's retar- uh, ridiculous. I caught it. <laughs> that's ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> that, is, that is the most terrible thing you could do. Worse than what I almost just said. Somebody's excited about something. Don't beat them down. Don't beat them down for what makes them happy because I guarantee you've got something that someone else thinks is just as ridiculous. Let's move on before we get canceled. Um, We will hide what makes us happy. Dear Jesus, come back in the room because we just want to fit in. God does not want you to squash what makes you stand out. If he put it in you, he put it in you for a purpose. It is there on purpose for a purpose. There is a reason that you have the quirks that you have. There is a reason that you have the things that make you unique, the things that make you the way you are. They are there for a reason. And just because people don't understand it does not mean there is anything wrong with you. Somebody, that's all you needed to hear today. But please stay till the end because there's more. They could just be bitter, the, bitter about the fact that they don't have what you have. People are always jealous. People will be happy if you succeed. But until you succeed a little bit more than they do, then they're not happy about it anymore. So they could just be bitter about the fact that they don't have what you have. And God can start blessing you in different ways, whether that be financially or just the fact that you have a family, whether, that, whether he blesses you with a promotion at work or with different spiritual gifts. Suddenly, people in your circle will start hating you at every step and start making little jabs at you and little comments that try to bring you down to their level. Misery loves company. Oh, you got another pet. Wow. Oh, you listen to that kind of music. I can't understand what they're saying. Good. Now I won't have to hear you butcher my favorite song. You like those kinds of clothes. Oh, you like those kind of books. Yes, because God gave me, he gave you your own personality to be who you are. He didn't want you to be a carbon copy of someone else. He created you to be the you that he wants you to be. And if that means you're a little bit different than those around you, that's just fine. But people don't like different. So the day comes... Later on, after Joseph tells his brothers about the dream, and they do the same thing. They see him coming at a distance, and they're like, oh, here comes the dreamer. Like it's a negative thing to have bad dreams, or to have dreams, not bad dreams. That could be a negative thing as well. Like it's a negative thing to have goals. Like it is a negative thing to have a drive for your life. Like it is a negative thing to have a passion or a vision. Like it is a negative thing to be called and used by God. Don't ever let someone else's ugly jealousy keep you from seeking the beauty that is Jesus. Keep your heart set on the right track and focus on what matters, God. Because those that mind don't matter and those that matter don't mind. And his brothers, unfortunately, they plot to kill him. And eventually they end up just throwing him into a pit and instead... From here, they throw him into a pit instead. And then from there, they end up pulling him out, selling him into slavery. And then he ends up getting sold into slavery in Egypt. That brings us to chapter 39. Right where we are in Acts 7. They sold him as a slave into Egypt. And that sentence ends with a period. And that means the story could end there. That could have been all that happened to him. That could have been the end of his life. That could have been the end of where he was going. That could have been the end of what was going to happen to him. But it is what comes after the period that continues it on. What comes after that matters more? And the Bible says, but God was with him. And most of us in this situation would be thinking that God has abandoned us, that the people we loved and trusted have kicked us to the curb, and they've hurt us for the last time in more ways than we imagine. And now we're stuck in a situation that we should have no business being in. How can God be with me when I am going through this living hell? But it says repeatedly, if you study the life 
of Joseph in Genesis 37 to 50, it says repeatedly that God was with Joseph so that he prospered. Everywhere He was sold into slavery, but he is given favor and a higher position in the house that he was serving in. He gets thrown into prison, but he is given favor and he begins to run everything in the prison. Where God puts you, he will provide for you. The old saying, where God guides, he provides. Just because it looks bad doesn't mean God isn't, isn't in it with you. Just because it looks bad doesn't mean God isn't fighting for you. Just because it looks bad doesn't mean God is doing something to do something through you and to pull you up out of it. Just because it looks bad doesn't mean that God hasn't put you there for a reason to provide for you, to show you his providence. You might have never thought that your marriage would be broken, but God is there to provide for you. Maybe it's a peace that passes understanding to know that this will not be for nothing. That the next guy in your life is not going to be a dummy that cares more about his hobbies than he does his wife. Maybe you never thought you would lose the baby, or a child, but God is there to give you the strength to make it through another day, to know that where they are now is infinitely better than the life that they could have lived here on earth. Maybe you never thought that now just putting groceries on the table would be so difficult, but God sent somebody or he is sending somebody to ring your doorbell and bring Publix to your doorstep. And in what looks like a terrible situation, where most of us would want to sit down and give up and die, Joseph continues on almost like nothing happened. See, he wasn't just a slave when he was in the house. He was serving with all that he had. He made the most of a messy situation. He said, I might be here right now, but I'm going to do what I can right here while I am here with what I have. So he served where he was at every time, never looking around wondering, why did this happen to me? And if you study it, nowhere else in the story does it ever mention his dream again. Nowhere. And we're always told by society, you know, by your friends and your families, oh, just follow your dreams. Just follow your dreams. Do what you want to do. And not that there's anything wrong with having dreams or a vision and a goal in your life. The Bible never once says Joseph followed his dream. It doesn't say Joseph remembered his dream. But what it does talk about is that he performed the duties that he was given wherever he was at. He served wherever he was, and God made him prosper every single time. God lifted him higher and promoted him higher every single time. And in this life, everybody wants you to chase your dreams so much that it will overwhelm you and consume you to the point that you're so obsessed with chasing your dream that if it ends up looking different or doesn't come to pass... How you imagined, you will end up in a state of depression. But I want to remind you today, do not let your ideas become your idols. Do not let the plan that you have over your life stop you from following the plan that God has for your life. I told you earlier, nothing can stop God from working his plan out over you, but your choices will directly determine some of the outcomes in those situations. Your bad attitude and desire to control the outcome and figure it out all on your own will become spiritual speed bumps, and you'll end up still getting where God wants you to be, but you're going to have a whole lot more bruises than you would have had if you would have just submitted to God in the process. Because if you completely submit to God, you will realize that if he is bringing you to it, it is for a good reason. He brings you to it. He doesn't bring it to you. Because then you're just spoiled. And you know, we say this in church. We don't, we don't realize our words. We say, oh, I found Jesus. No, Jesus found you. He found you and then you realize just how broken we are and how lost we are without him. And we see the goodness of God. We see in Acts 7, the story unfolds. And the story unfolding in Genesis. And we think, surely being sold into slavery is not a good thing, right? Obviously. 
obviously. But that's because we're looking at it in the wrong light. We're viewing it from our limited point of view and never from the view that God has over our lives, just like when he is working something out for us. So how can Joseph, the favorite son of Israel, the one with the dream of having his family bow down to him, how can this still happen? How does he go from having a dream that he will be royalty and now he's a slave? And he's a slave in Potiphar's house. And one day, Potiphar's wife starts catching the wrong feelings for Joseph. Don't worry, I won't get too too, uh, PG. She gets the wrong feelings for Joseph, and she starts trying to get him in bed. There's no kids. I had to look. She starts getting him in bed. The Bible says that he is well-built and handsome, and she keeps trying to sleep with him. And she keeps trying, and he keeps saying no. And she keeps asking, and he keeps refusing. See, more so than he cared about the position that he was in, in that house, he cared more about his commitment to God and refused to sin. And then one day, she ends up tricking him. No one else is in the house, and he goes in to do his duties, and she tries it again, but he leaves without his coat. And it's not the same coat that he had in the beginning. And she ends up running to the other servants of the house and lies about it and says that he tried to come on to her. Fellas, y'all be careful who you're hiring at your house. Hey, y'all quiet today. Wake up. So, if you know your Bible, and if not, I'll give you a little bonus piece of information. If you, if you notice here, Joseph is again cursed because of clothing. His brothers deceived his father with his cloak, and now this lady is deceiving her husband with his cloak. And this echoes, if you know the story of Jacob, Jacob and his mother ended up deceiving Isaac with clothing to look like Esau, and they stole Esau's blessing. This is continuing on what Jacob had already done. And then Potiphar comes home. And don't worry, I'm getting to the preaching. This is just the information for y'all. When Potiphar comes home, she gives him a similar story, but she's really not that good of a liar because she ends up twisting the words, and she says to the servants that he came to insult us, but she tells Potiphar that he came to insult me. So she's already changing her story. And now here's the fun part, right? Joseph gets thrown into prison. Y'all are like, how is that fun? There's nothing fun about prison. There is when you know that the prison was preservation. There is when you know that the prison was preparation. See, good old little pot pot Harry Potiphar over there was the captain of the guard. And this meant that he was in charge of all of the executions. And Joseph is accused of trying to sleep with his wife. But he is thrown into prison instead. The prison was preservation. See, he could have, he would have, if Potiphar actually believed her story, and he should have been executed. This is the exact scenario that a slave would have been executed for. And I don't know about y'all, but I can't say that I'm holy enough that if we hired somebody to come like mow our grass, and then I come home and Kelsey said the dude tried to do what this dude did, I've got enough land and some shovels. We'll leave it at that. So I don't think Potiphar truly believes what she's trying to say. I think he was putting on just a little bit show because he cared about Joseph. So instead of being executed, he's sent to a place that can actually end up equipping him for the next part of his life. See, the prison was preservation because he was spared and allowed to live. The prison was preparation because of where he was locked up. And he was locked up with the king's prisoners. This means he's locked up with political prisoners. See, if you know where I'm headed with this story, if you know the story of Joseph, he is eventually released after he interprets Pharaoh's dreams about a coming famine for seven years. And uh, he's, he's released from prison, and then he's put in charge, literally just like second in command, just underneath Pharaoh, so that he can uh, store up grain for seven years of, of abundance for the seven years of famine. That's how we get to Genesis 50:20. When he says that what his brothers meant for evil, God meant for good. That's why we apply this verse so much to our life. Oh, what what the enemy means for evil, God means for good. You know the song. But we don't see that in real time. 
We only see it in retrospect. When we look back and we see where we are and where we were, we begin to connect the dots and see just how good God has been to us. We see once we are lifted out of the pit, what the purpose of the low places were. See, the kingdom of God works different. The lower that Joseph was taken physically, the higher that he ended up being elevated after he was low from being sold into slavery and lower by being placed into prison. He was eventually elevated by God into a position of power. So while you're down in the dumps, while you are in this low place, continue to commit to God and know that this will be for you, your good. What you think is a setback is a set up for the future that God has for you, that he is moving you to. And you might not physically, obviously be in a prison today, maybe tomorrow. Just kidding. Just kidding. You're not in a prison today, but maybe you're in a a prison of your perception. You're trapped in your thoughts. See, the, the prison that Joseph was in was pretty much just in another part of Potiphar's house. So he's essentially on house arrest. And maybe the prison that you have is in your mind. Your mind is a mansion that you're stuck in. And it looks so dark in the place that you're in. And you never thought that it would be like this. But, you know, I have heard it said that our God is a dark room God. And you're in a position that you never pictured yourself in. And for those of you that don't know what a dark room in is... Since we live in an Instagram society where you just take a digital picture on your phone and then put a bunch of fake filters on it like nobody can tell how airbrushed that looks. A dark room is because there used to be pictures, and there still is, taken on film. Film, that's what the pictures were taken on. And see, on your phone, when you click the shutter button, you instantly get the picture. But when you take it on film, it doesn't come out immediately. It has to go through a process. So when you take a picture on a piece of film, it's called a negative. Oh, y'all don't see it yet. It doesn't look too good at first. It's called a negative, and it has to go to a dark room. And God is a dark room God. See, the dark room is a special place that doesn't have a regular light bulb. It has a special light that helps the, that won't damage the product. It is a special place where special things happen. It is a place where you take the negatives, and it is then it then develops through a special process. And to where you see the final picture, that's where you get the final product. You don't see the process. You only see it after it has developed. And while you are in a dark place, while you are in a place that you haven't pictured yourself in, realize that you are still just being developed. And what looks like something that could be dragging you down, and maybe it looks like it's dragging you backwards. Has anybody ever heard of a thing called a bow and arrow? See, the way a bow works is you have to pull backwards on it before it can be used for its purpose and then launched forward. So it looks like you're being pulled back, and it looks like there's something that is pulling you back, but God is using it. Whatever you are facing right now, it is preparing you for the future that you are about to step into, that God is calling you to that he is moving you to, that he is guiding you to, that he is shooting you forward in the process too. But it might take a while. See, Joseph, while he's in prison, he interprets two dreams for two different people. One is the chief cupbearer, the other is the chief baker. One's going to be lifted up and returned to his position. One is going to be hanged. Which one do you want to be? The chief cupbearer is lifted up. And Joseph asks him, when this happens, please remember me. And one of the most depressing verses in the Bible, it says that he forgot Joseph. And he remains in prison for two more years. Has anyone in this life ever helped someone out, helped them get into a position, and the second that they got where you helped them get to, they have immediately forgotten about you and acted like they never knew you? 
They just brush you under the rug and move on with their life. And you end up remaining in the same place for a longer period of time than you should have. And it can make you bitter or it can make you better. But Joseph never allowed it to make him bitter. He just kept serving. He didn't let someone else's promotion poison his soul. If you can't celebrate someone else's victories, don't expect a victory to be headed into your life anytime soon. That one stings, doesn't it? Awfully quiet here in this Presbyterian Episcopalian Baptist church. He didn't let someone else's deliverance cause him to fall into a depression. He just kept serving. Until one day, Pharaoh has the the dreams about the famine. And Joseph is the only one who can interpret it. The only one who can give God's interpretation for it. And the cupbearer is like, oh, no, I forgot this guy. And he brings Joseph in. They uh, shave his head because apparently Egyptians like a completely bald noggin. And he goes up and he interprets Pharaoh's dreams. And then he gives Pharaoh the idea of what to do, to store up the grain and how to make it all happen. And he becomes, like we said, second in command. So now he is in a position of power and wealth. And this is where most preachers, you know, would do. This is where I was headed for the uh, from the prison to the palace. That how one night you're sleeping in a prison, one night you're dead in your sins, and the next night after you get Jesus, you're in the palace. But thanks to Dave back there, God had to change my message. So (laughs) Joseph is now in a position of power and wealth. And this very, very, very easily could have tempted him to change his lifestyle. He could have been made bitter by what happened to him and chosen to leave his Hebrew nature and his Hebrew culture all behind to turn his back on God. This could have tempted him to just reject everything and move forward in the new position that he has. And I think this is why when God does something, it doesn't usually happen overnight. Because if it happens overnight, you end up just thinking that it was something you did or you think it was luck or a fluke or fate, whatever you want to call it. Sometimes it's not going to happen fast. And you, because then you, if, if it happens fast, you'll think it wasn't God. And that's why this doesn't tempt Joseph. This doesn't make Joseph stumble because he was preserved in the prison and he was prepared in the prison because God's providence was all throughout the process. God's providence is all throughout the preparation. But we want it to immediately happen because we want to see God just move through our lives so all the troubles will go away and we don't have to do anything. We just want to prop our feet up on the couch and Jesus come and save us of our sins and beam me up to heaven, Scotty, and we'll be done. We want it immediately, but God always takes the slower route to build us up for his blessing, to transform our minds for his message, for his plan. He does it in his way so that we learn to trust him in all things and seek him in all things because he is working through all things for us. That is why the story of the suffering of Joseph wasn't all for nothing. The suffering that you go through isn't all for nothing. And where a lot of people are tempted to believe that a good God wouldn't cause bad things to happen, it's not God's fault. It's our fault that we have the sinful nature and we deal with the problems that we have to deal with because of the fall of man. And one day, yes, it will be corrected. But it's not for nothing. Jesus knows your suffering. He has suffered with you. He has suffered for you. And he knows what it feels like. It's not all a bad thing. See, now there's a famine coming. And Joseph was told about it. And he's given the wisdom to plan for it. And he's given the power to do what needs to be done. And maybe you find yourself in a situation where you're constantly like, Why me, God? Why is this happening to me? Why am I going through this? Why can't you just take it all away and make the pain stop? Why can't you just make me win the lottery so I don't have to worry about these bills? But see, if Joseph wasn't sold into slavery, 
Who would God have used to tell them about the coming famine? Who would God have used? Because it says that the entire world had to come, and buy, obviously not way over here, but this whole surrounding world had to come buy grain from Egypt. So you have to stop asking, why is this happening to you like it's a bad thing? Like it's going to be the death of you. You need to ask God, why this? Why now? What is this for? What are you wanting to use me for in this situation? What do I need to learn in this season of my life? Because God wants to do things through you, to impact people through you, to impact those around you. This is why the vision of the church is to see the impact of God's work through you. See, the day comes when Joseph's brothers have to come to Egypt to buy grain, and they bow down to him. And it is in this moment that his dream is realized. And he's not sitting there saying, is, is this it? He realizes at this moment, this is it. This was the dream. But the dream looked different. See, he thought the dream was for a position of power. But the reality was that the dream was a position to provide. There is a reason You are where you are right now. There is a reason it is taking longer than you think it should take. There is a reason you are where you are. There's a reason the people who are in your life right now are in your life right now. Because God wants to use you to see the impact. He wants you to see the impact of his work through you. And you surely think, oh, he could just do it through whoever he wants. But you could be the reason that someone finds Jesus. God wants to use you to get into places and to get into people that otherwise would never see his glory. It will be different than you imagined. Look look at the life of Joseph. Abraham is promised to be a blessing to others. I told you earlier... This was most directly fulfilled through Joseph. While he was in Potiphar's house, everything that he does is blessed. Not just him. The entire house is blessed. Potiphar is blessed literally just because Joseph is there. And he prospers because he's still serving God. When he is in the prison, he prospers. And for all the Bible nerds, I hope you caught the parallels here between Joseph and Jesus. They're both sold for scraps of silver. They're both placed in a position with two criminals and only one gets restored. They're both used by God to reverse a curse. Jesus reversed the curse of death and sin, yes. But Joseph is used to reverse the curse of the famine, to reverse the curse of his family line being threatened. The family line of Abraham, they come. To Egypt, and they see the son that they rejected, the son that is now going to save them. But if they end up staying in Egypt, the line of Israel is threatened because then they're going to marry the Egyptians and start following the false gods. So Joseph literally ends up using uh, the Egyptians' hated shepherds. So he tells you know that his, that his family is shepherds, and they give them a whole different plot of land where they're left alone and allowed to build up. And obviously you know what happens 400 years later if you've read Exodus. But God wants to use you to get into places, to get into people that would otherwise never see his glory. God has placed you somewhere. He has placed you in someone's life to bless them, to reach them. Possibly the only person that stands between them and eternity in hell. Or maybe the thing that you struggle with, the prison that presses against you, is something that you face every day that God wants to reverse through you. The curse that he wants to reverse through you. Maybe it's a generational curse that you struggle with, but you refuse to let it continue into the lives of your children. But God has put the strength in you to survive. The strength 
to survive this struggle. And your life doesn't look like what you thought it would. But God gave you a dream of deliverance. But it ends up looking different because you're not quite delivered yet. But you still got to fight against it. And you're still struggling against it. But maybe the deliverance is not just for you. It's through you for them. Because the chains that you're breaking right now are something that could be over the lives of your entire children. They could ensnare your children. The chains against you could be against your children. But God has raised you up and placed the strength in you, within you, to fight against it so that your children will never have to face what you have been facing. And one day you'll be able to push through that struggle and tell your kids how God brought you through it. So that they will never have to go through it. And maybe that is why God sent you ahead of them. See, Joseph's brothers, when they finally get to Egypt, and he finally reveals himself to them. After seeing where their hearts are, he he tests them to see if they have changed. They don't recognize him, but he recognizes them. And they end up, after bowing down to him and after he is revealed to them, they are afraid of where his heart is because they know what he did to him, to them. And now they see the dream as well. And they're bowing down to him and he is in a position that he could just have them killed. But in Genesis 45, verses 4 to 8, then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. And stay on verse 7. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Leave that on the screen, please. He dreamed that they would bow down to him. And yes, the dream meant power, but it ended up looking different when they arrived at the destination. It wasn't about the power. It was about the provision. The dream was not about Joseph dominating them. It was about Joseph delivering them. And he was sent ahead of them, going through a life that he never pictured in order to provide for them and save them. And in verse 8, he says, So then... It was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. It was God. God sent him there. What you meant for evil, he meant for good. God meant it for good. He meant it for deliverance. He had a dream that he gave Joseph, but it wasn't his brothers that ended up sending him there. It was God. And maybe you've had a dream about your life, and the dream came from God. But you weren't like Joseph, and you kept it close to the chest because you didn't want to get mocked. And you didn't tell people about your dream because you just want to fit in. And I don't want to show people my true personality because I just want to be accepted. But now you're sitting here in this place, and you need to realize there is only one person whose opinion matters about you, and that person is Jesus, and he has already accepted you. He is already accepting you. He has always accepted you. When you were walking your own way, he accepted you. When you threw him aside into a pit, he accepted you. When I was without his covering and I wasn't following him, he accepted me. When my sins sent him to the cross, he accepted me. And like Joseph, Jesus has never been bitter about you. He just wants to bless you. And maybe you're not where you want to be right now, but God is building you. God is guiding you. 
But you can't arrive in the palace if you stay stuck in the prison. Joseph didn't stay stuck in the mindset of why me? Why did they do this to me? Will I ever see my family again? Am I even going to survive this? Joseph didn't just sit down and die. He kept serving because he knew God would bring him to the purpose. So in the meantime, he kept serving with all that he had, with all of his heart, not being bitter about what someone else got before him. He just wanted to be a blessing to the people around him. And he stayed serving. He just wanted to help people. God wants you to do what you can, where you are, with what you have. Everybody always says, think outside of the box. You need to think inside of the box. We all have limitations. But that doesn't mean we're stuck by them. God can use your limitations for his glory. And God is directing you towards someone or something for a reason. And what he is teaching you through something that seems so trivial. What is he trying to show you? When you think, I'm not supposed to be here. I thought my life would be different. I thought the state of the country would be different. I didn't think my kids would grow up in a society that looked like this. I don't even know if I want my kids to grow up in a society that looks like this. Who is God trying to reach through you? What is he trying to break through you? And maybe you think that your prison walls are too thick and they're too high and the general curses just run too deep. And the Bible told us that Joseph was sold as a slave and we have all been slaves to sin and you're still facing something and you're stuck in a situation. But the Bible says God was with him and rescued him from all his troubles. And sometimes the troubles are from our own making. And we make our own bed and we've got to lie in it. And we've got to face the things that we made from our own decisions. But there is always grace and compassion on the other side of those consequences. And sometimes the troubles are from outside of our control from people that we didn't expect to hurt us, from situations that we never expected to happen. But if God brought you to it, he will bring you through it. What is he bringing you through today? What is he bringing through you today? God wants to do something to you. He wants to do something through you. Everybody close their eyes. Let's... There is a reason things are the way they are. There is a reason things are the way they are. And I don't want to turn the pulpit into politics. But the state of the country, we have turned our back on God for far too long. And we are feeling the pains of the rejection. Not that God rejected us, but that we rejected him. And it is a shame that too many Christians... who have just wanted to stay under the label and identity of conservative, decided that it was more important to us to just want to be left alone so we could live our lives, that we let the enemy come in and plant seeds across everything and fill every office imaginable and make things that happened that never should have happened. You can read the Bible and you see the story of Israel. 
how they always ended up getting complacent and turning their hearts away from God. And that is when he removes his hand from them, the blessing from them. And it is then that they feel the pain of that loss, the pain of the disconnect from God when he removes his hand. And there is no more protection. There is no more provision. And they finally turn their hearts back to him. We shouldn't have to turn our hearts back to God. They should have never turned away from him in the first place. God has put each and every one of us here at this time for a reason. To do something. Even if that something is nothing more than getting on your knees and praying for this country, for praying for others, or even just serving others in any capacity, whether that's in the church, in your job, in a nursing home, to the homeless, whatever it is, God is wanting us to serve and be a blessing. He has to be at the forefront of everything we do. And I believe we are about to see the season of revival, the season of restoration. But the danger of that, just like the Israelites, is that we can get complacent when that happens. And we don't want to feel the move of God anymore because it's just we're used to it. I don't want us as a church, as a society, I don't want us to get complacent with God, to get used to God. We should always be seeking more of him, more of his glory, seeking to show him off more to the world, seeking to serve him more, seeking to show him more to other people, just like Joseph did. He was in others' lives And he blessed them simply because he was there and because he loved God. And people that would not have expected or even known about God knew about him and talked about him just because of Joseph and the blessing that they received from a godly man being in their life. And while they might not have been converted, we don't know. That's not the point. The point was that he just served God with all that he had, where he was, with what he had. God has put you somewhere in someone's life, in some position, in some house, in some job. Because he wants to show his glory through you. He wants to bring people to him through you. And I don't know how that looks for your life, but I do know if you just trust him and follow him and see it through to the other side, it will be better than anything you have ever imagined. And if you're in a situation today where you have never even heard about God and you don't understand the sins of humanity, but you feel your brokenness and you're moved and you want to know more about Jesus, I want to lead us in a prayer. If you feel the tug and you feel pulled towards God, don't run away. Walk towards him. Take his hand and he will guide you. And your life will be forever changed. Jesus is the only one who can satisfy. And everybody together with me, 
And this is not a magical prayer. It is to apply the Bible. If you believe it with your heart and confess it with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, because he is, you will be saved. Because God loved you and he loves you. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, even no matter what you do, he's never going to stop loving you. And he just wants you to come back into his arms. So as a church, if we can, together repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending your son who died for my sins and rose again so that I may have eternal life. Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your love. I make you my Lord and Savior. I will follow you all of my days. Amen. Amen. If that is your first time saying that, or if you are coming back to God, there is a party in heaven for you. There is a party. And if no one has, if you don't even know what that means because nobody has ever celebrated anything in your life, heaven is rejoicing because you have entered into eternal life. It does not start when you die. It starts from the moment right there that you said that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. And in a minute, they're going to sing one more song. And the altars are open. If you want to come forward and get prayed for, someone will pray for you. If you don't have a Bible, if you don't have a Bible and you would like one, come see me and I'll make it happen somehow. Can I give y'all one more thing? The bonus round for those who stayed and put up with a strange message, message, those of you who have joined us for the first time and you haven't turned it off, can I give y'all one more thing? Okay. You're going to get it anyways. Joseph was sent before his brothers to save them and deliver them. And in Colossians chapter 1, it says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your mind because of your evil behavior, but now... Now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Joseph went before his brothers to save them and Jesus is before all things. He is there before you. He is holding it all together. He was there before all things. He was there at creation. He was there before your birth. He was there already loving you, already choosing you, already planning to deliver you. And he has already reconciled you. He has already redeemed you. All you have to do, all you had to do was accept him. Maybe that should have been the sermon. He went before you and had it all done. Hey, I hope that message spoke to you today. I want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at Family Church and those who help support this ministry. If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you, and you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. 
Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.